Giant Sparrow describes themselves as a small video game company focused on creating surreal experiences people have never had before. Their dream is to make the world a stranger and more interesting place. And if you have had no experience with what is currently their only two games, The Unfinished Swan and What Remains of Edith Finch, I have to say I agree, well at least partially. Because yes, their games contain things I've never experienced before. Imaginary lands and tall tales that made my brain do a double take. Or give classic responses such as, huh? or oh. But the root or backbone of their games is something so tangible and experienced by all people that I'm hard pressed to think of more universally felt human stories. With a narrative finger never far from the pulse of loss, forsaken, or what may have been feelings, Giant Sparrow delivers on a cathartic experience I can't get anywhere else. With an almost storybook sensation, it's no coincidence that both games have a heavy interaction with books or journals, and credits that read more like my roster of all-time favorite indie game developers, Giant Sparrow has been around for 10 years and has delivered the two most interesting, well-balanced, narrative-meets-mechanic video games I have ever played. Both inspirational and aspirational, their creations are legendary in execution. I won't be diving into the creative director of the studio, Ian Dallas, or other people that worked on it. I'll leave that to more professional documentarians. I much more just wanted to take a moment to appreciate these two fine pieces of work and maybe learn a bit more from them. A quick rundown of what we're going to be doing here. We'll do a story overview of both games, avoiding spoilers. I'll stop for those who want to get off the ride and go experience the games for themselves. Then I will do a deep dive into them. Beladen with spoilers of all types, these games are at least seven years old, so I feel no guilt. And I don't think you would gather the true impact of the narratives unless you played them no matter how much I told you about them. In the deep dive, we will look at the integration of mechanics and story, effects on both player and characters, followed by my thoughts and feelings, and then we all get to go home. So let's get to it and dive into a studio study of Giant Sparrow. The Unfinished Swan was initially released in 2012 on the PS3 to generally favorable reviews, winning a couple BAFTAs and nominated for Best Downloadable Game of the Year, which now sounds quite quaint and patronizing looking back. There is not much of a splash for the arrival of one of my favorite games ever created. And with a playtime of two hours and gameplay mechanics that develop just enough to leave a player complaining, hey, I wanted more, the Unfinished Swan, though named such for narrative reasons, can inspire the thought that the game in itself feels a bit unfinished. Gaining steam over the years, Giant Sparrow re-released it on PS4 in 2014 and Windows and iOS in 2020. The story of The Unfinished Swan revolves around a young boy who, after losing his mother, finds his way into a magical land ruled by a foolish king and the remnants of the kingdom he had left behind. The game is both visually stunning and narratively touching. For me, it runs as philosophically deep as you want to take it. And trust me, that's where I'm going to take it. And do not be mistaken, it is a game, there are hard mechanics, with fail states and everything. Well, at least reset states. They aren't often or ever present. This isn't a game you battle foes. There are puzzles, and they are usually easily solved. But they are smart, elegant, and engaging. And when it comes to a game, these are some of the most powerful things you can be to me. Often, a player wants to feel smart, and often, game designers want to make the player feel smart. But when I sit there and do something in a game and revel in how simple and intelligent something is, that's when I really feel amazed. That's when I say, dang, you did something there, and I admire that. You just made a song. As for Giant Sparrow's second endeavor, What Remains of Edith Finch has a bit more notoriety. Released in 2017, it too runs about two hours, and was part of the much debated scene of the don't use that language in my house walking simulator genre, which has always had a little bit too much controversy and conversation around it for my taste, keeping company with other favorites such as That's a Baby Game and Get Good. Anything that questions something's validity in a category while squarely being in that very category is what I like to call silly. And no, I don't want to talk about entertainment versus art, or games versus art, or what makes a game. Thank you, no thank you. What Remains of Edith Finch is the story of a 17-year-old girl revisiting her eclectic family home six years after leaving. The sole heir to the property and reading the journals of past relatives 
she tries to come to an understanding of why her mother sheltered her from them. What remains of Edith Finch begins with an unknown individual reading the journal of the titular Edith Finch. Initiating the playing experience, we become Edith Finch, 17 years old, revisiting her family home, located on Orcas Island somewhere along the Washington coast. We revisit family members' memories through their journals, creating a kind of journal inside of journal inception. What remains of Edith Finch is much less a fairy tale than its predecessor. It is still fanciful, but possesses a grounded nature. This, to my mind, is to address the lived lives of the Finch family. This is not to say it is realistic or literal, but it is primarily grown out of the feelings and experiences of a teenager instead of a youngin. What Remains of Edith Finch is a lovingly crafted master class in linear level design and environmental storytelling, possessing soft mechanics with no true fail states except the intended ones. It has more heart and craftsmanship than any movie I have ever seen in my entire life except for maybe Barry Lyndon. The level of knowing and relating to the members of the Finch family through what is sometimes the most innocuous items is beautiful. All right, so there's the two games made by Giant Sparrow, The Unfinished Swan and What Remains of Edith Finch. I guess you could say I like them, admire them. For those of you who don't want to have the story, plot, mechanics, music, even sound effects turn for you, some might say go bad, others spoiled, your time has come to leave. It's been fun, go play games, they are good. And a last little tidbit before those people go, they are brief, which I think only now is really becoming an admirable trait of a game. Seems we needed to push out a few 80 hour plus Assassin's Creed games before we as a community and industry was like, what are we doing? Do we all really want to be Scorsese's? Do we want to fire all editors? Only be able to play one video game a year? I don't think so. Brevity is good. Succinctly expressing something is a virtue, unless you make YouTube essays. So now, let's dive in. To start, the primary mechanic of the unfinished swan for its first levels has given some people motion sickness in the past. I don't know if you have to be playing it or if it's just the visual aspect of this that makes it happen, but just as a fair warning, if you start to feel weird, you should just listen or skip ahead because it's not just you. As you begin in 2012's The Unfinished Swan, you are greeted by a sweet storybook tale of a young boy Monroe whose painterly mother never finished paintings, or raising sons, dies. Monroe takes a single painting of hers to the orphanage, The Unfinished Swan, and one night the swan gets up off the canvas and leads Monroe to a magical unfinished land of white. This is when you begin control. It is off-putting for those who patiently wait for the game to say, we are starting because we have a reticle and nothing else. It took me a minute the first time playing to understand what was occurring as I moved around. I heard noises and sound effects and eventually pressed the correct button. The primary mechanic to start this game is using ink to uncover a path in a world that is all white. Only by hurling ink at your environment can you understand your path. To me, this carries numerous meanings. That creating incomplete splattering throughout the land is indeed the only way to move through it. That unfinished things are the only true way to navigate this world, and thus carrying some significance narratively, as a youngin, Monroe incompletely raised must too move through the world. If you were to be a perfectionist and demand to cover all things in ink, it would actually be impossible to move through the world. And at some point in this beginning, it may be revealed to you that this incomplete path is also quite beautiful. Of course, this is all touching and very sweet to me. I'm a feeler, a crier, a what some might call softy. But in design, it demands that not all things created will be seen. That is, to complete this game would be to make many assets that most people will not experience. This is something that many of my favorite games share. As a creative, you will have to make things, invent stories, create worlds that may not be consumed by an audience. To complete your art, there must be some things left behind. Games have a hard time with this. Such things are seen as waste and not tolerated often. Anyway, the mechanic is beautifully used from its first moment, from revealing the path forward through angled halls to the opening reveal of nature. This is when we begin to see the trail of yellow swan footprints. They seem to appear always just at the right places where areas become too vast or a player may feel overwhelmed or lost. There are many other guiding environmentals, such as the sound of water and animals, but the footprints are there for the less brazen. I would imagine for most players, the uncovering of the world through paint is enthralling in its inventiveness. 
encouraging discovery. Through this mechanic of giving you direction and sight at once, it gives way to other inventive uses, such as the accidental opening of a gate or finding a breakable path forward. It turns the path into both your journey of discovery and is designed to lead you in a singular route. It is well done. After some rooms introducing you to the gold items that led you inside, and even a balloon which introduces you to the vessel of unlocking extras in the menu, one thing you will see is a yellow letter. And this is most interesting. The story of the kingdom you are entering begins. The king was young, arrogant, and amazingly talented. The reading of the story pages by a narrator adds to this storybook experience and introduces us to the character of the king, who is arrogant and has everything white to be perfect, believing his creations too good for color. I love this, and as you may have already noticed, there are many seeds of Alice in Wonderland. You are led by a white animal on a journey. There is a ruler who is arrogant and demands things their way. And the entrance point to the kingdom you are taking is through the garden. So while splattering black paint everywhere, I feel a similar scene to the painting the roses red, but now inverted. It is a nice illusion. Pushed forward through hints of color, or really anything you can see whatsoever, the game lures you into its golden path. From this point on in the game, they will give you landmark goals, something that you can gauge your location by as well as find your way to, creating another linchpin in the discovery and direction-based gameplay. For this second area, we come across our first true puzzle. Having fallen down from our path, we are in a room with an exit elevated to which we cannot reach. With a door on either side that leads to the same room and a hole that leads to its own ceiling, the room is an infinite space that runs into itself from all directions. To help illustrate this, there are golden vases that fall, giving us hints to the solution. Once through, we come across a curious thing. This is when the gameplay broadens in scope. The first time I played this, I was quite disappointed when we weren't going to stick with the initial zero depth perception, all or nothing black and white but it's understandable that making a player scour every environment for their next step could be tedious or eventually get boring. So on with it. The story goes that the subjects of the king were tired of banging shins and getting lost, so they began painting things. The king got frustrated, banned all non-magical brushes, and painted all the shadows in the kingdom to help his constituents. Shortly after, we are introduced to not just the shadows, but also the blue of water and more monsters. So here we are in a black and white and blue and shaded world. Much easier to navigate, we are now free. Being the first concession we have heard of the king making, it is suiting that it is shading, because shading and the onset of shadows gives perspective to an image. And what could be better suited to be the first thing a magical king gives his constituents, perhaps in a sense of trying to see things from their point of view. After this, we come across the king's first study, containing paintings of the kingdom, a miniature of the garden you just passed through, and complete with easel of self-portrait of self-portrait of self-portrait. Outside, we come to the maze, an endless and mythically proportioned thing. Thankfully, we will not be experiencing the whole thing, and only a small portion, fairly easy and manageable. I myself have made a few games based around mazes, and as it turns out, people don't think mazes are fun. Now, I'm not sure I think mazes are fun, but I can tell you, I'm not going to be putting a maze in anything I make anytime soon. After completing the maze, we then climb the tower to the hot air balloon. We find out that the king long ago painted a boat and frustrated with people's demands of wanting to see and not wanting endless mazes in their lives, sailed away and never returned to the kingdom. Here, we can look down at the maze we passed through, the splash paint that helped us through it, and climb into the hot air balloon to continue chasing the unfinished swan. This is where the game pulls out from the storybook and shows you we have completed the first part of the game, giving allowances to a player to be able to revisit parts and collect balloons and whatnot. It is a nice thing to do for players, and probably also to keep development organized and things pieced nicely. When we return to the game, the boy Monroe is enjoying the flight of the hot air balloon, and not as lost or afraid as he initially was at the start of the game. The balloon gets close to the unfinished swan, but when Monroe attempts to reach it, he falls out, landing in the waterways of a city. Here we have a sleeping giant and a floating ship for landmarks. Throwing our trusty ink, we find it has been transformed into water balls, 
not nearly as compelling of a mechanic, but now that the city is navigable, the removal of ink balls makes plenty of sense. They can be used to flip switches and evaporate quite fast. Following swan footprints, we find our way through some basic puzzles, like filling up waterways, and are told that the pottery around the kingdom is also one of the early creations of the artistic king, that he had once refused to create bathrooms for the townspeople, and when they used the pottery for their needs, he quickly created sewers and bathrooms. This section, though not as ingenuitous, does move along quickly and guide you properly to fill the waterways and head down the tunnel. We then get taught about ladders, the ability to jump to them, and how red switches work. It is functional, and for the most part, laying the groundwork for much more inventive and meaningful game design later on. After a brief navigation puzzle and a reminder of where we are headed, we come to a courtyard filled of thorns and dead plants. We are told that the canals we just traversed were the result of the king's frustrations, that the streets filled with trash and as more people came to the town, fed up, the king painted over the road, sweeping it all away. Along with the waterways, there came a new development, which were the tedious vines that began to cover the entire city. We move through a brief darkness that alludes to evil red-eyed spiders that exist in this world, and release water onto the grounds. From this ball of thorns, we see a single green vine, and this is our true new mechanic. The water balls lead the vines to grow wherever we may want to lead them, bringing the dead old garden new life. We are told from the story that the king ordered the townspeople to pull up all the unruly vines, but the people secretly started to water them. The king may have been annoyed by the vines, but in our hands they are a delight, a beautification and pathmaker of their own. The vines are a pleasant concession to my gone favorite ink balls. There are some small secret vine moments that are fun nonetheless. The chaotic and beautiful swirling of the vines are wonderful and brings to mind that though I don't have exact control of where the vines go always, they do result in new paths. That change is always thorny, but often leads to something beautiful, and in this case also gives us new opportunities. And here, from time to time, it does encourage one to think, just because I don't have control doesn't mean I can't find perspective. Some of these small moments in gameplay are the coolest, like when you come upon these stained glass windows, you try to use the vines to do something with them and chances are you'll make them swirl around the area before moving on. But as you get to the next area, it prompts you with a little peeking vine from the very windows you were intrigued by. We are then told of how, to destroy the wild vines, the king employed the creation of a monster. Made of malice, paint thinner, and snot, it is an assurance that we always create the worst monsters we know, and usually out of frustration. The monster he created ended up eating all of his soldiers and half of his zoo, but with the help of the giant and his pet hippo, they pushed it into the sea. Soon after that, we meet a brief mechanic that communicates to us exactly what to do. This is one of those things that tells me, yes, we know the initial mechanic was fun, but turning it up to 11 is more fun. We move along our created path, and having learned that we can hit things while climbing, we know exactly what to do for the rest of this area. At this point, we are told that all the king's subjects left the town post-monster incident, and we get a chance to look at the beautiful path we made. We get into the flying ship and set sail after the unfinished swan. We are then told of how Monroe followed the unfinished swan into a darkness and got the ship stuck in a tree. Then, Monroe jumped down into the darkness to find his way out. In this new level of darkness, we have the King's Monument to guide us. Having been exposed to it previously from the telescope, we understand it to be our new goal. Here we find our previous water balls are now back to black ink, and quite useless in this pitch. In this new environment, we have lost all productive tools. However, looking up, it does become apparent we have the night sky now to guide us. Our old acquaintances of the dark, the spiders, have returned, and this time with a vengeance. Using our ink balls, we can hit glowing vegetation for illumination as we move from one safe zone to the next. Some, we find, are just out of reach, and find that indeed the spiders can harm us. Now it's not immediate, but they do enough damage to make it clear we will likely get respawned. We eventually come upon a movable light, and a new mechanic arises. Hit the ball forward, but not too far or fast, as to get left behind. It is a simple but effective game. At one moment, it ends up in a puddle, and we see it as buoyant, 
a hint of things to come as we roll it into the river moments later. Now, the idea is to keep pace, finding the path and avoiding darkness, as the current does the work for you. The story continues that the king is tired of imperfect subjects, so he wants to make a family, beginning with a house, and then he paints a wife, a female version of himself he falls in love with. Around another corner, we come upon a window into what looks like a blueprint world, one that reflects the house we just saw by the river. We jump through the painting to find a new kind of experience, a respite from the darkness which I enjoyed, to be sure. Here, we look around but find nothing, eventually throwing another ball, but this time it has changed again to create coordinates on an XYZ plane. Now we can create blocks. This is one of the more mechanics heavy sections, at least on the programming side of things. Blocks from the ground are green. Blocks created as ledges are pink, purple, or fuchsia, whatever that is, and yellow for key location blocks. This mechanic, though very smart, and puts all the craftsmanship into the player's hands, is not nearly as inspiring as the previous ones. Perhaps it's because it's not beautiful. Maybe it's because it's so utilitarian. But when we take a look into the door we reach, we are shown that the corresponding house in the swamp now possesses stairs as we created them. We are told the king gifts his new wife with a silver paintbrush and shown her painting many paintings. He tries to paint new areas for the house, but always scraps them for their imperfections. Meanwhile, she paints the wildlife, which though incomplete, she does not scrap, as well as finding out that she is pregnant. Now we find ourselves in another blueprint puzzle. This one is more involved. I do have fun creating things with the block mechanic, but they lack the magic of the ink or the vines. We eventually find our way up the tower, at which we find another telescope, and here is a small nod to Genova Chen's help, a little reference to the game journey. Then the tale continues that one day the king woke up and his pregnant wife had left, only with one painting, the unfinished swan, and he never found out why. Over the next nine years, he didn't paint anymore. Then he decided to build a monument to himself as a legacy for the ages, but he didn't even finish painting the scale model before his powers began to fail. He never finished another painting and fell asleep and dreamed a dream that he never completed. From a boat, we arrive at the monument to find that the gates and the ladders are electrified. We hit a lemon out of a security electricity thing, and there is some joke here as to a lemon being the source of electricity, or perhaps a reference to a lemon battery. Even though lemons can't be batteries, it's the zinc and copper used in a lemon battery experiment that creates the electricity. But I digress. Maybe it's just cute, and lemons are sour. But as we knock out the security device, it turns out it was holding the water at bay, and we have here our final puzzle, a timed navigation game of racing up the tower, during which we see numerous paintings and eventually arrive at the king's study. And here is the end of the main game as we wake up the king, and experience the rest of the story through selecting the final chapter. The king says you are the boy from his dream, and then tells us the story of how, in the house he grew up in, he heard a knock on the door, and entering, he found only white space. Here, we play again, only as the king equipped with water balls. We find ourselves in the beginning of the game again. He tells us someone had painted over everything, which was definitely us. We move through the first area of the game looking at our handiwork, and we go through the king's dream retreading our journey. This is when the credits begin to roll. Fourth wall breaking, the credits are pointed out by the king and his pet hippo. Did I, did I mention his pet hippo talks? And we use all the mechanics we've learned to traverse his dream. The king recounts to us his dream step by step, from seeing his abandoned kingdom and maze to a city covered in vines. At one point, he hears a joyous feast around the corner, only to have it disappear as he arrives. We have little cute moments of us seeing ourselves in the mirror and eventually it turns to the dark river. Through this, he describes how he was tortured by the impermanence of things and is soon to come death. We have a moment by the river that we get to use the XYZ mechanic to build a block that floats down river. I enjoy this moment to see some mechanics used in a new way, even if it's in the credits. He comes upon the house he built 
acknowledging that things he built to last forever will soon be gone before even he is. In the dream, he eventually arrives at his own funeral, and no one is there but little Monroe. And as you approach his casket, in the mirror you see you are Monroe. We eventually move forward, walking toward his monument, we grow larger and larger, eventually pushing it over. We move further, seeing all of his life's work. As he comments, he painted over what was once there before him, just as someone will do after. And eventually the universe will end and everything he made will be over, and he thinks of all the things he has left unfinished, and how he had fun making it either way, and would have done it no matter what. And that's when little Monroe woke him up. He is happy to see Monroe and hands him his magic paintbrush. He tells him that he hopes he will be a better man than his father was. And Monroe leaves through a door. Monroe is back in bed at the orphanage. And that night, he paints a swan with two swanlings. And that is the end of the unfinished swan. Some things from this game I dwell on are the ideas behind how our monuments will crumble and our legacies will end. That true impact is through the inspiring of future generations, is sweet, dark, and deep. I think it's something everyone thinks about at some point in their life. How best to leave an impact before our time is up. And I think the game does a very good job of taking its weaknesses and acknowledging them, even to the point of making some of them strengths. This is something we'll see reflected in Giant Sparrow's next work as well, even along with the message of Legacies of the ego always end, but the legacies of the heart, selflessness, and inspiration proliferate through everyone you touch. The more I think of the king, the more I feel for him. When I played this game at release, I, like most probably, felt like Monroe, young and exploring, messing things up as I went along. But of course, with aging, I really do feel more like the king and his shortcomings, even reflecting on many of my own. And in the end of this game, I do know that its philosophy stands correct, that we should pass on our dreams before we ourselves pass on. Some beautiful design moments of this game where initially when you begin and you're in the white room and you have no idea what to do, as you throw the ink around the room and to find only one little corner reveal itself is quite intelligent. It's inspiring to take such a trapped moment and turn it into a revelation. Another moment I love is when we walk up these steps, there is only one of the two ways we can actually go up. And when you turn around, which eventually will happen, the letter on the wall will be revealed to you. This is one of those classic tools you'll see in numerous moments of their games, that it's a linear path, but full of discovery. Another moment I adored was the bucket on the ledge. If you haven't put together that there is a vine growing out of the stained glass window, when you see the bucket, and it's next to a broken banister, there is something in you that will want to knock it off. And by throwing that ball of water, you will cause the vines to grow, revealing the path forward. And the final moment that I love the most is while climbing on the brass bars, when you eventually come to an end, you have no idea where to go, and you know you can't go all the way back, but eventually you'll look down and see the path before you. They are simple, but you would be surprised at how often the care isn't taken in a game, that just a little effort can really elevate an experience, that respecting your player's time and effort can really affect them. And these two are traits you will see again in Giant Sparrow's work. What remains of Edith Finch begins with the player on a ferry reading the titular Edith Finch's journal. From here, we will embody Edith Finch as we jump into her perspective as she visits her family home at 17. The sole heir of the estate and having not been there in six years, the first thing to note is that the tone of the themes, graphical style, and music are significantly more mature than the previous game. Making your way up to the house provides you with two paths. This is appreciated given the stereotyping of the limitations of games in this genre. And if you do go through the trouble of taking both paths, you get a cute little achievement. Edith's narration paints across the screen for us as it comes to her, or, to be exacting, as it's read by the character reading her words on the boat. The first impressions of the Finch's house is the eclecticism it wears on its sleeves. Its towering add-on speaks to the only semi-grounded nature of this world, and the key given to you by your mother doesn't open the front door. The need to enter the house through the side doggy door tells us that nothing in the story will be direct. 
and the Finch family has almost its own language and understandings. Inside we find something so cozy and lived in it's hard to believe someone didn't just recreate a house they grew up in, which for all we know may be the case to some degree. Wandering around the house, I don't feel like I do in other digital spaces. It lacks the cold efficiency of a level designer. It is filled with books and materials of all sorts in relation to family members. We see some missing posters of a boy, some slightly packed up boxes, and eventually find our way upstairs where we come upon what will be a kind of introduction to our levels. Each room's door was sealed by her mother when they left, and each door has a peephole affixed. Marked with the name and years the person was alive, each room is like a time capsule or a mausoleum. These are the rooms of the Finch family tree. Having only one door open upstairs, her uncle Walter's, we naturally go there first, and the beginning of the game loop begins. We unlock a book, find a secret handle, and go through to the next room. It's a common theme that all the Finch's secrets are held in books, so this is a fitting beginning to our journey. The first room we enter is Molly's, alive from 1937 to 1947. Searching her room, we find some small animal masks on the wall, a dismembered starfish, and it paints a picture of a curious girl, kinda twisted, kinda funny, and a room designed to a T for the years that she was alive. Finding her journal on her table, we begin to read it. Starting with what seems to be Molly waking up in the middle of the night, she is extremely hungry and we cannot stop eating. Her childish nature is adorable and silly. Everything she does is just a little squeamish, like eating the old carrot left in her rabbit's cage, or devouring a whole tube of toothpaste, plastic berries from one of those Christmas things. It's extremely visceral and tactile, something we've probably all imagined doing. A bird at the window leads Molly to the windowsill, where she turns into a cat, turning into a complete animorph situation. And this is where we get the polymorphic controller scheme that mutates from experience to experience. In this, the attention to detail is meaningful. We know that Molly died in December from the calendar in her room. And as the cat outside, we see the lights and ornaments. Molly comments about her parents as she walks past their bedroom window. This is the beginning of seeing the heart of the game. Moment to moment, we jump minigame to minigame. In this one, from cat to owl to shark to Lovecraftian nightmare. It's a terrific way to introduce us to the way the finches work. We know this is when Molly died chronologically, but any explanation is not given. Is it the very night that she died? Who knows? That's what a lot of these stories play like, a special place of ambiguity. Sometimes we get facts, sometimes we get interpretations. We get to gobble down rabbits as an owl, and munch on seals as a shark, and then humans as a monster. It was a perfect balance of feeling a child is reporting her dreams, while also containing what we will come to love about this game. The embodying of a great many different people. At the end of being a monster, you crawl through the pipes all the way back to sleeping Molly's body, where you lurk under her bed and she whispers to you that she can't wait forever, and the monster will eventually get her, and that she will be delicious. After the journal entry, we fill out our family tree in Edith's journal, as well as have a new understanding of the layout of the house. We go to the window, crawl out, and make our way to great-grandmother Edie's room. Another facet that will be reoccurring is how our adventures in our familial journals will often prompt us to the next step of our journey. Inside Edie's room, we get some dialogue that tells us Lewis died a week before they left the house, and Edie memorializes family members by painting their portraits onto a log's cross section, a tree slice, also known as a cookie I learned today. One of the more beautiful storytelling devices in what remains of Edith Finch is the alluding to events, family members, and stories that we do not know yet. Some of these will be filled in throughout the game, but some will not. This greatly increases the grounded nature of the experience. We find a small memorial to Odin, the family's patriarch. It's revealed through a small viewmaster the story of their immigration. The Finch family was famous in Norway for their fortune and bad luck. Odin sailed across the sea with the family house in tow, hoping to leave behind the family curse, but instead hit a storm off the coast of Washington, and the house and Odin fell victim to the waves, leaving his daughter Edie, her husband Sven, and daughter Molly to begin their new lives. Odin is the first to be buried in the family cemetery. Edie's room has a few entertaining items that reflect a great sense of humor. 
From her interview with a tabloid that a mole man lives under the house, to the death of Sven, which she says was due to a dragon, neglecting to mention it being a dragon-shaped slide that collapsed. In a pink bathroom, we find another locked book, leading to a small dark room, which we can presume was Edith's grandfather, Sam, from her comments. Next, we come to Grandpa Sam's childhood room. He had a twin he never spoke of, and the room is charming in its twin setup. Sam, who wanted to be a soldier, and Calvin, who wanted to be an astronaut. Their sides of the room are made up as such. On Calvin's side, we find a small letter written about his past brother, Calvin, bringing us into the memory of Calvin on his last day. We are swinging as Sam narrates the letter, praising Calvin's determination and bravery, as well as commenting on Calvin's remark of wanting to die before eating another mushroom, which he did. Lines like this reflect the confidence in which what remains of Edith Finch addresses death. It is charming. Some might say it's dark comedy, but I like to think it's light and a genuine love of life. Sam says at Barbara's funeral, the twins swore that they would never be afraid again, and they weren't. Calvin's want to fly, cast on his leg, and love of astronauts reveals to us exactly who this kid is. As the level begins, we understand our goal is to loop over the tree branch, and as the player, we know this will not end well for Calvin. But at this point, we embody a fearless little boy who has made up his mind. And akin to games that put you through things you don't want to happen, this time, we get to roleplay as a fearless child. No matter the cost, you want to live up to your promise with your twin brother to never be afraid again. And in this moment, in this game, you are given license to do just that. Sam's narration of missing and admiration of Calvin feels real. Comments about how even if he hadn't doubted Calvin's ability to do it, and he had survived that day, Calvin might still be there, but Sam doubts it. The memory ends with Edith filling out the family tree. The twins' bedroom shows us, much like Molly's room, with what great attention and detail their rooms are designed, with a pitch-perfect execution of period set design. From here, we go on to our next secret passage. I love how a game about visiting bedrooms turns such an expected experience upside down. A game about going to everyone's bedroom and we won't use a single bedroom door. Crawling through the tunnel, Edith makes a cute remark about the size of the passageways and how they were made for smaller hands and bellies. We then exit into Barbara's room, where we pick up that she was once a child star, with a cutout that's like Harry and the Hendersons meets Shirley Temple the life of the childhood star had become one of a food service waitress at a diner in her teens. I like many of the details in Barbara's room, from the beer under her bed to the stolen Barb Street sign. It is just one more aspect of the game that feels so familiar to any person's teen experience. In Barbara's story, we get to experience it through the narrative stylings of the classic Tales from the Crypt comic, or at least a ripoff of it. Being a has-been, Barbara's death was exploited for entertainment, and this is one of those publications. This is really fun, because at first, you're just following along the story. But as we go along, it makes you play more and more of the story. The tale of Barbara's last night is during Halloween, as her boyfriend and her look over her little brother, Walter, at the house while her father and mother go to the hospital because her father, Sven, got a hand injury. There are reports of a hooked hand killer on the loose, and hearing sounds downstairs, we are shown the secret to getting the key to the basement. Her boyfriend Rick goes down and disappears. Searching after him, we find his crutch downstairs and use it as a weapon, journeying through the basement. Turns out Rick is just pulling a prank, and Barbara is pissed and kicks him out of the house. Later, we hear Walter scream, and Barbara goes to investigate. We make our way to his bedroom to find he is missing. Barbara is then attacked by the hook hand killer. Fighting back and eventually knocking him through the upstairs banister, we go downstairs to discover he has disappeared. She tries to escape the house, but instead we get a twist ending, and it ends with her famous childhood star scream. The boyfriend disappeared that night as well, and all they found of Barbara was her ear in the music box they kept the secret key. In the end, it turns out Walter was hiding underneath his bed, which is pretty cool because it gives the impression that when the player camera was watching from under the bed when she was attacked, we were embodying Walter's viewpoint. Barbara had always wanted to be remembered, so Edith comments that perhaps the comic book is more of a happy ending than most would think. 
Now knowing the path to the basement, we use the music box to go downstairs. A side note, the music box is a little replica of the scene of one of Barbara's movies, which is pretty cool. And also the song is the same from the menu music, which I enjoyed. In the basement, we discover a doorway through the back of the refrigerator. It leads through a tunnel to a bunker of sorts. It is clear that someone has lived here for some time. And when we come upon the memorial down there, it turns out to be Walter's, who the family, or at least Edith, had believed had left. As Walter, we play through 30 years of staying in the bunker, eating canned peaches every day and listening to the radio go through the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s music. Walter, who has been down here all this time out of fear of the thing that got Barbara, gets tired of waiting, tired of being afraid, and tired of hiding. He decides to finally leave. Opening a hatch and climbing further underground, he picks up a hammer and breaks through an outer wall, climbing to freedom. Walter wants to stop living in fear, even if it kills him. He wants the journey out in the world and is going to live every moment like it's his last. And that's when he is hit by a train. Edith fills out the tree with one more cursed family member and we move on. Something so interesting is that the Finch family is built on their tails, perhaps many of them tall. They are the self-mythologizing narrative that tells the family what kind of people they are and what kind of challenges they need to rise to the occasion of. Edith reminisces about how her mother must have sheltered her out of fear, not telling her any of these stories or letting her into any of the areas of the house. Edith doesn't want to hide from the truth or make the mistakes of her mother, but does have reservations about how maybe these myths themselves have been the thing to lead each family member to their doom, and her mother may have been valid in her avoiding telling her. Edith acknowledges it might be better if the tales die with her, but she wants the reader to know about the family and their history. And I have to agree, even in fictions, we find truth. And I think that might be why so many relatable stories are present in this game. As a kid, I used to imagine being animals like Molly, imagine flying off the swing set like Calvin, and pining after fame like Barbara. The house is full of a quirkiness of memories of family members and more, things we both love and find alien which I can't say I haven't felt in my own homes throughout my life. We traverse through the bunker's hole, eventually gain to the train tracks, where we find our way to the family cemetery. We can see the old house that sunk at sea off the coast, and Edith describes her feelings on the family cemetery. Eventually we come to a telescope, taking a peek, much like in the last game, and have another smartly designed guided path moment. Edith works hard to come to terms with her mother's viewpoint, even if she preferred her great-grandmother's imaginative takes. We get hints of the dead uncles of Edith's as well as her two brothers, and this is when Edith tells us that she is 22 weeks pregnant, and then we climb up to Grandpa Sam's room. Sam, the twin of Calvin, who grew up to be a soldier, a hunter, and a photographer, had no fear of death, and as Edith says, at times, even went out to meet it. At his shrine, we find an envelope of photographs and embody Sam on a hunting trip with his daughter Dawn, Edith's mother. We get to understand the bookish Dawn on an at-odds trip with her father Sam. We jump from Sam to Dawn depending on the picture we are taking and get to experience their bonding and disbonding as Dawn shoots her first deer. And for the trophy picture, the seemingly dead buck throws Sam from the cliff in their last photo. It's one of the more powerful stories as this time we get to see physical documentation of the events. And not just the death of her brothers, but her father as well informs us of how Edith's mother was so compelled to shelter her daughter. The embracing of self-mythologizing is a dangerous one if taken to the extremes, and I'm sure Don felt it was too big a risk. The next entry we find is divorce papers of Sam and his first wife. The story is written on the divorce papers. It is Sam writing to his soon-to-be ex-wife, Kate describing the inner joy and imagination of their now deceased toddler Gregory. This is when we get to play as little Gregory taking a bath a year old and his last bath he'll take. We as the player have built up enough emotional armor, hopefully, to take this on. Playing with a frog and rubber duckies in the bath, we listen to Tchaikovsky's Waltz of the Flowers, the last number in the Nutcracker Suite which just so happens to be a ballet about how something that is broken can be given new life. But maybe that's reading a little too deep into the choice. 
During the bath, Gregory's mother is arguing with Sam on the phone, and after the bath is emptied, she is distracted by the ongoing fight and Gregory knocks the bath faucet back on and drowns. Sam's letter to Kate being read out loud is compassionate and blameless, and is only jealous of the joy little Gregory had. It is done in a surreal and fantastical way, and its lightness only makes it more heartbreaking. Next on the list is Don's other brother, Gus, who also died young. This story is told through a childhood poem by Don and tells the story of stubborn Gus during the second wedding of Sam, where Gus demands to fly his kite during the ceremony on the beach beside the house. A storm comes and through the disobedience of Gus, he ends up being struck by something toppled by the storm. This is one of the less fulfilling mini games of what remains of Edith Finch. Guiding a kite around and blazing through the lines of the poems is engaging, but I must admit, not as invigorating as the others. We then move up to the loft, where Dawn spent her teenage years. We learn that she went to Calcutta and built houses for a summer, presumably missionary work given the Bible on her desk. She met Sanjay, and Louis, Edith's older brother, was born a year later. At some point, Sanjay passed, and that's when Dawn moved back to the family home along with Lewis, Milton, and Edith. They built more rooms onto the house, and we get to go through the garden and the kids' homeschool classroom. We find out Don Finch wrote a book on teaching. Then we move on to Milton's room, where we find some familiar imagery and music. Milton was a painter, and when we enter his room, it becomes very clear that we are dealing with the unfinished swan. A small scale of the garden, the first level of the unfinished swan sits on his table, as well as numerous other pieces of art. As it turns out, Milton is the king in the unfinished swan. For his journal, we get a small flipbook. It shows him being given his magic paintbrush from a self-portrait. He used it to paint a doorway, which he entered and never returned. This is when my interest is piqued in this game. When it comes to continuous universes, I'm a sucker. I don't want 27 film series like The Avengers. I want something with the loose ties. I want illusions. I want Remedy Games, or in this case, Giant Sparrow. There are a million theories online about the connections between The Unfinished Swan and what remains of Edith Finch, but I'll leave that up to you to dig into if you so desire. Next, we make our way to Lewis's room. A teenager from the late 90s, he has glow-in-the-dark posters and hookah. Searching around, we find his psychiatrist's letter to his mother, Dawn, describing the end of his condition, when he got sober while working at the cannery and became increasingly delusional until he got carried away. This is the culmination of mini-games and what remains of Edith Finch, as we process tuna with one hand and navigate his daydreaming with the other. It evolves from a top-down game, to an isometric, to sailing ships, to first person. We are told by the narrating psychiatrist that his delusions were increasingly enrapturing and as such takes up more and more of the screen as we play. It is a delightful minigame and integrates the decapitating of the tuna with many gatekeeping moments of the daydream. As you play this part, you too get carried away, forgetting to process the next tuna as you focus more and more on the fantasy of Lewis's kingdom. It specifically speaks to the dangers of the gamification of life and how we can all become swallowed up by a fantasy that has no space for reality. And at this point is where we get the story of the last day Edith and Dawn stayed at the house. This time, as Edith Finch writes in her own journal, she tells us of the packing of their things and how great grandma Edie refused to leave the house, as well as a secret gift Edie left Edith, a history of the Finches, and as we read the book, we embody Edie on the night of Edith's birth. She tells us the tide went out so far she could walk all the way to her father Odin's sunken house on the coast. Making our way through the fog and seeing deer and other anomalies, we think we finally will get something special, some sort of answer, some clarification. Excited for a more substantial take from the matriarch of the family, we sit on the edge of our seat. But Dawn interrupts and takes the book from Edith, leaving it unfulfilled. Dawn takes Edith from the house right then. And when people from the old folks' home come to pick up Edie the next day, she is gone. We then jump from moment to moment of the next six years of Edith's life, from a car ride, to holding a dandelion, to holding Dawn's hand in a hospital bed. Edith says, if we lived forever, maybe we could try to understand things. 
but as things are, we should appreciate how strange and brief everything is. Edith hopes the journal won't be needed and she'll be able to tell you all the stories herself. But if we are reading it, then she didn't make it. And that's when the journal closes and Edith's son puts flowers on her grave aside the house. What follows is a gut punch of any credits I've ever seen, as family photos and baby pictures are given for all the people that worked on the game. As far as direct, voiceover, human narratives go, I don't think I know of a stronger one. And despite what I call soft mechanics, what remains of Edith Finch disregards this limitation and runs with its strengths. One thing that I kept coming back to during this game was how there is no tutorialization of interacting with objects or the minigame memories. Like Edith moving through unknown spaces of the house, we just have to figure it out, struggling and faltering to understand how things work each time anew. When this game ends, I expect myself to feel incomplete or unfulfilled, but instead I feel whole, a circle of a person being exactly who they are. A game about so much death, you'd think it would bog you down. However, I feel it emboldens you to tread your own path. It's a beautiful and strange creation, a terrific sophomore works by the studio, and a powerful addressing of death in our lives. The game, just like The Unfinished Swan, uses certain tools I find very interesting. Being, again, essentially a linear journey, the way in which it is designed to teach and familiarize the player with spaces, create a mental map, but also keep things fresh, are smart. Some of my favorite small moments are, of course, the turnaround in the graveyard, the classic walk up a single path and turn around to be guided down a new one. I hope to use this someday in a game because it is so simple, but keeps up the curiosity of a player. And next, of course, the telescope, which foretells Odin's story. A true signature of Giant Sparrow's works, the use of a telescope says, hey, it's an important landmark and is not subtle at all. But that's the beauty of these telescopes used. In the world of the game, someone affixed it with a purpose. So instead of having some gaudy cinematic take control from the player and point at something and say, hey, look at this, they have this, and it is effective and efficient and in-world and beautiful. The hints of Edith's pregnancy in the game are subtle and perfect. My favorite ones are that the player cannot run, which most people will notice and kind of give up and just say, okay, they decided no running in this game. The next one is climbing through to Barbara's room when she says it was made for smaller hands and smaller bellies. And the last one right before she reveals it at the end of the graveyard, when she says she wouldn't have come if she knew there was so much climbing. The way that this game is written so purposeful, step by step, makes it so much more powerful. Another thing I love about this game is the tree slices, cause you know, it's a family tree and the years of a life on the rings of a tree, it's a nice parallel. Also, the house itself in its wonky construction and the tears is almost identical to the family tree, which I thought was pretty cool. These two games were so important to me because of their design and efficiency, and I was happy to study them so closely. Often we play a game, watch a movie, or listen to a song, and just kind of say, hey, I like that thing, it's hard to dissect something to understand it better. I think often we are scared that if we look at something so closely, or even a second time, it won't stand up on its own. But things can. Games are a powerful medium. I remember on GameCube exploring environments to a point that they felt so cozy and so real. They were worlds I wanted to live in forever. There was clear craftsmanship at work and love put into the creation. Heck, sometimes I just loved a low fidelity rendering of a book or a chair. It's often said that music is the fastest way to transform your attitude, and this might be accurate. But what if I don't want fast? What if I'm looking for the deepest change? What if I want to sit in a space and be raptured away? Sometimes I've heard people say movies are where we get away from it all, or get to turn off our brains. But games are where I'm transported most sincerely with the tide of music and the depth of movies, with a sprinkling of the empathic possession of books. Games are terrific, and we are only at the start of their history. As always, if you have any recommendations, inspirations, salutations, feel free to reach out. If you think I'd love or hate something, I wanna know. 
This has been Fib Likely and Play Games because they might just be the most important art form ever invented, built on hundreds of years of mathematical theory and engineering just to make a tiny square of light dance across the screen thousands of times a second. And I think that's pretty cool. <laughs>